Good day students, welcome to the first recording of module 6, Enzymatic Browning and its Control. Just a reminder that the content that is covered in these videos are merely a summary of work that has been extracted from different sources. And the sources are usually your textbooks. So I've uploaded all the links on Blackboard. You need to go consult those, read for better and in-depth understanding. So what is this? chemical reaction known as enzymatic browning. So the first thing for us to be able to know is that we need to understand what are the components that are involved in enzymatic browning before understanding the actual chemical reaction. So enzymatic browning is a chemical reaction that involves three main components. You have what you call polyphenols, you have oxygen and polyphenol oxidase. So this chemical reaction usually takes place in raw food products like your, your, your fruits and vegetables and also your seafood. Of the different fruits, we usually have your apricots, apple, pears, bananas and avocados where this browning takes place. And in vegetables, I think you would have come across this at home or in your everyday life where you see your potatoes, your mushrooms and your lettuce browning. And it has also been found to actually take place in your seafood, like your shrimps and your spiny lobsters and crabs. So in this reaction, those three components that I, may, uh, I, I had mentioned will then react together and then form a brown end products. And usually when that happens, it becomes something that's undesirable. So as a result, those fruits and vegetables are then discarded because they the attributes has changed and we already know when consumers buy they first perceive the color so therefore it becomes undesirable but it's not always the case that enzymatic browning is undesirable enzymatic browning also becomes desirable in other food products like we'll make an example of your enzymatic browning that is then required during the fermentation of tea from green tea to black tea so those enzymes are required to drive the fermentation and then it also happens in your other products like your cocoa bean before it's roasted it's then fermented and also at the same time it also takes place in your your raisins and prunes so it becomes desirable and undesirable but in this section or in 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 in, in this video we'll only be focusing on the undesirable effect of your enzymatic browning so as we had already mentioned that it involves three main components so the three main components um if we talk about polyphenols oxygen and polyphenol oxidase so they are contained in this raw material within the cells however when those raw material like your your apple your banana when they are intact enzymatic browning does not take place so enzymatic browning starts when the cell integrities is actually compromised during your cutting, your slicing, your dicing, and your pulping. And the reason for this is that when all those three components, or mainly the two components, your polyphenol oxidase and your polyphenol are in the cells, they are separated. Your enzyme polyphenol oxidase is actually located in the cytoplasm of the cells away from the enzyme, uh, or the polyphenols that are found in the vacuole. And once cell integrity is lost, then the oxygen in the atmosphere then comes and react and then obviously oxidation takes place. So the chemistry of enzymatic browning is whereby there are actually three main steps taking place. So the first step is whereby you get these polyphenols or what we can call them monophenols, depending obviously on the structure. Some of these polyphenols, they become complex, whereby they are made up of a benzene ring with a hydroxyl group. And then when they are polyphenols, that's when they have many more different types of, of, of benzene structures brought together. But the main characteristic is the benzene group, 
with a hydroxyl group so in the first step of the reaction is that these substrates known as monophenols the monophenol is then catalyzed by an enzyme known as monophenolase or you can call it chrysolase so this chrysolase catalyzes the first reaction that is known as hydroxylation so in that reaction you find that that this enzyme catalyzes the addition of a hydroxyl group to the ortho side of the monophenol by therefore forming what we call an orthodiphenol or, or orthodihydroxyphenol so that becomes the product of that step and then from there the so-called formed orthodiphenol then is also catalyzed by the, the the enzyme diphenolase in the process of oxidation whereby that hydroxyl group there are now two they become oxidized by losing the hydrogen to form what we call orthobenzoquinone so in those two um, processes or steps oxygen is required as a core substrate if there's no oxygen the reaction does not take place so uh, the preformed um, benzoquinone are highly reactive because they lost electrons so in that way when they are highly reactive they then go to step number three that is known as polymerization because because they are so highly active they want to react with anything else that's found in the system as we already know that in a food product the food product is mainly compo composed of your carbohydrates your protein and, and 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 your lipids so then because those quinones are highly reactive then they want to polymerize with the other food components and in that process that's called non-enzymatic polymerization and the polymerization of those benzoquinone with those other components forms the brown polymer melanin a very important the first two steps hydroxylation and, and oxidation um, involve enzymes however the products that are formed which is obviously your diphenol and your quinone are colorless so that means that the reaction has started it has taken place it's just that color formation is not yet visible however in the third step that's when your colored components are formed and in food processing especially when enzymatic browning is undesirable we don't want to get to this step because then you perceive the brown color and then the food becomes discarded okay so we have mentioned that in terms of what we are focusing on in this step or in this chemical reaction is the undesirable part so if something is undesirable it has to be controlled and I always say if you want to control a chemical reaction you need to know the actual chemical reaction and the steps so that you can target um, certain sites or certain uh, 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 things on the actual chemical reaction so if you want to control browning we control browning in two ways just like any other chemical reaction that's controlled in food science there is physical ways of controlling that reaction and there's also chemical ways and we usually go to the chemical ways when the physical ways don't work so the physical ways of controlling also the chemical what do we look at so we target the substrates of the substrate we target the oxygen get rid of the oxygen or get rid of the phenols because those are your substrates if we are targeting the enzyme um, as we already know something that we've done in food chemistry too is that your polyphenol oxidase are what we call metalloproteins that catalyze oxidoreductases uh, chemical reactions so if the PPO is that type of a protein we even go back to the fact that it's made up of your EPO enzyme which is the protein part and then the non-protein part which happens to be the copper prosthetic group that's why it's called metalloproteins so all in all that whole enzyme is known as a hollow enzyme which is a complete enzyme so it means that we can have different sites on the actual enzyme to target what we can target is the whole EPO enzyme as it is we can also target the thiol groups that are on the active site and then we also can target the copper group the copper prosthetic group that is also on the active site so we can do it in three ways and then lastly 
um, we can also target the products that are formed. As we already mentioned, we had three products that are formed. We formed a diphenyl, a quinone, and then melanin. So target uh, in terms of products, we can actually get away with targeting the diphenyl and the quinone because then color formation hasn't started. So it is actually futile trying to target the melanin because by then color production would have taken place. So the next step is then we're going to talk about the physical ways of controlling browning. So when it comes to physical ways of controlling browning, it's more targeted at the enzyme and oxygen than the substrate. So with the enzyme, what we can do to the enzyme is we mentioned enzymes are proteins. So we can actually blanch at high temperatures and then the protein becomes denatured. We already know about that. What we can also do is we can expose the temperatures to low temperatures of refrigeration and freezing. We know that they are not as effective as blanching. They do not deactivate the enzyme, but they lower the enzyme activity and that way you lower the chemical reaction uh, rates. And then in terms of oxygen, so we can actually um, get rid of oxygen or prevent oxygen from accessing the reaction. So how do we go about doing that? We can do, uh, we can apply control atmospheric uh, packaging and modified atmospheric packaging whereby we can flush out the, the, the oxygen using nitrogen. Obviously the nitrogen does not then participate in the reaction. We can do vacuum packaging, um, vacuum packaging whereby we, we take out all the oxygen and then thirdly, we can also do immersion. So what we can do is that we can immerse the product in either water, uh, brine solution, or sugar solution. And some people also want to immerse in honey. What is very important when it comes to this physical control of browning, it is very important that whatever method you want to use to prevent browning, it has to be compatible because I cannot now want to immerse my peeled bananas in a salt solution it's going to test salty so it's changing now uh, the, the the taste profile and i also cannot want to blanch my avocado but i can blanch my potatoes i can blanch my cauliflowers or my peas so in that way whatever physical method that one employs it has to be compatible and then we then come to the chemical way of inhibition the chemical way of inhibition or controlling browning is usually uh, what the industry um, adopts more than your physical ways of controlling browning and that is done via introduction of your food additives or what we call your inhibitors so the inhibitors also function in a similar manner like your physical control it targets certain sites within the chemical reaction so it still targets um, the inhibition towards the enzyme targets the inhibition towards the substrate and then also inhibition can also be targeted towards the products. So of the different classes of inhibitors, there's six different classes of inhibitors based on their mode of action as to how are they actually preventing this browning. So first of all, we have what we call the acidulants. So acidulants, what do acidulants do? Um, the acidulants, they, they bring about lowering the pH because we already know that um, enzymatic browning or any type of chemical reaction that involves enzyme, it becomes affected by pH. Each and every enzyme has its own specific pH range and the pH range where polyphenol oxidase functions the best is between 5 and 7. So if you add acidulants by bringing in protons, it lowers the pH way lower than pH uh, 5 and 7 and in that way you can see there that um, at these low pHs then your, your, your browning will be inhibited. So of the different acidulants we have citric acid, phosphoric acid, acetic acid and then ascorbic acid. One thing about these um, acids they also act, um, they also have other different mode of inhibition of browning and we'll talk about that. And then secondly, we have what we call chelating agents. So chelating agents are then also targeted towards the enzyme. What they do is they chelate the copper prosthetic 
group rendering it inactive remember we said if the enzyme contains both the EPO enzyme and the prosthetic group for it to function it requires that prosthetic group to be in an active form to obviously catalyze the transfer of electrons so by chelating making it inactive so what happens is that you stop the reaction and we can use your 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 chemical compounds such as your phosphates your EDTA and we also have sulfated polysaccharides and then we can also use organic acid another organic acid that can be used for that is citric acid which then has a dual role because it also acts as an acidulant and then later on we also have what we call your complexing agents your complexing agents also have dual mode of action because then they are targeted towards both your substrate and then your enzyme so what do they do is that um your complexing agents we have examples like your cyclodextrins and then we also have what we call sulfated polysaccharides and those sulfated polysaccharides are also known as coating material so they coat how do they go about coating they kind of engulf the 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 the, the substrate and then by doing so they prevent browning so a classic example will be your cyclodextrin what cyclodextrin does cyclo means cy in the cycle so it's dextrin so it's glucose molecules that are joined together in a cyclic manner in such a way that this uh, chemical compound forms something like a, a truncated cone it's like a, a cup so what happens is that when it's forming this inclusion those um substrate your polyphenols become included it's like absorbed into those cyclodextrins and by being absorbed in that cyclodextrin then it's prevented from reacting with your enzymes and in that way it becomes um uh, separated from the enzyme and then the enzyme cannot actually get to it so what happens is that um these uh cyclodextrins are also known as adsorbances or an adsorbent then it actually undergoes the complexation as i already mentioned with the substrate and then it physically eliminates it from reacting so what has been used is that um, cyclodextrin has been used a lot in the removal of phenolic compounds especially in raw juice to just prevent um browning and that is usually something that has been patented in the united states okay so then secondly um, in terms of this complexing agents, um, complexing agents are also like your sulfated polysaccharides, they are also targeted towards your enzyme. So what they do apart from com com uh, com uh, complexing and forming inclusion complexes, what they do is they also exert their inhibitory through chelation of the copper prosthetic group. So they are more of chelators than they are of your complexes okay and then from there we also have what we call enzyme inhibitors so what do enzyme inhibitors do if we still go back to food chemistry 2 where we spoke about inhibitors of a, a chemical reaction whereby if you have an inhibitor you can have what you call a competitive and a non-competitive inhibitor whereby the inhibitor kind of resembles the same um, shape and structure of the substrate and then it goes and lodges on the active side of the enzyme when the rightful substrate comes and wants to react then the reaction does not take place because the 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 the, the, the active site has been occupied and we had already mentioned that usually these competitive inhibitors they have a higher affinity to react much faster with the with the with the with the enzyme so in this case we have what we call your aromatic carboxylic acids like your benzoic acid so benzoic acid you can see it also contains a benzene ring it's just that it differs from your phenol in that it does not contain a hydroxyl group but it actually contains a, a carboxylic group so it's an acid group so what it happens is that this is going to occupy the space on the active site 
but the fact that it's not a phenol then the polyphenol oxidase cannot catalyze it and in that way that's how you prevent the browning and then you come to um, what we call enzyme treatments so we can apply enzyme to treat the substrate so enzyme treatments as I already mentioned are targeted towards the substrate so what do we do there um, is that we have an enzyme known as O-methyltransferase so ortho methyl transferase well, what it does is it then transfer a methyl group and it usually does that to a diphenyl than your monophenol so as you already see here's a monophenol it will then catalyze the reaction of transferring a methyl group on the ortho side of that phenol and then what happens is that it changes the chemical structure of this phenol to something else and thus then the newly formed compound is then not the substrate for that enzyme so the chemical reaction does not take place um in terms of enzyme treatments i mean enzymes are very expensive so this is not a type of reaction or or uh, control that is actually applied in the food industry it's usually for research you know when they're researching enzymes but not necessarily in the food industry because then it might render the product very expensive so um, some enzymes also proteases can also do that and also methyl transferase also does the same and then lastly we have what we call reducing agents so what are reducing agents um, going back to your chemistry reducing agents undergoes oxidation and oxidizing agents undergoes reduction still remember that so what these compounds do the reducing agents are targeted towards the product and the product that they are targeted towards is usually the benzoquinone the highly unstable benzoquinone so what they do is that they reduce the benzoquinone by donating a hydrogen and take it back to what to being a less reactive diphenol so it's actually a way of delaying the onset of melanin formation and polymerization and so on so you have your sulfiting agents i mean sulfiting agents also do that and they also complex and they also chelate so you can already see that they have triple ways in which they can prevent browning and then you have ascorbic acid also and it's analogs the ascorbic acid analogs analogs are your um, sodium ascorbate or potassium ascorbate you have cysteine we all know that cysteine is an amino acid we have glutathione glutathione is is a tripeptide and it's also an antioxidant so what are we going to do now is that we're also going to focus on the type of your um, inhibitors that are mostly and widely used in the food industry and obviously they owe this to their you know, their dual or triple function of, of 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 inhibiting enzymatic browning because they have different ways or different modes of action of of inhibiting browning and as a result they are preferred the most so the first one that we are going to talk about will be your sulfites we've already mentioned them it's just a recap so your sulfites um we all know that sulfites are mostly used inhibitors of a whole lot of chemical reactions i mean we know that sulfides are also used as antimicrobials so they are used to prevent um antimicrobial or, or microbial growth in food they are used in wines and then they are also used to also prevent non-enzymatic browning so they they they, they have multi-functional roles that's why and they're much cheaper so that is why they are preferred so this sulfites we already know where they come from so sulfites um they include agents of sulfur dioxide and several forms of its inorganic sulfides that then liberate sulfur dioxide under the conditions of their use so you have your pure sulfur dioxide you have your sulfite you have your bisulfite and then your meta bisulfite so those are the forms in which your your, your sulfites are used okay and then obviously we know that when it comes to sulfides the sulfides are then um, depending on which type of sulfide they are affected by the pH of the medium which is very important so what do sulfides do we already mentioned that in terms of the sulfides in terms of, of, of preventing browning 
what they do is the first thing is that the proposed mechanism of your bisulfite it's actually exerted towards what we call a competitive inhibitory effect on the polyphenol oxidase why because what it does is it goes and bind to the sulfhydryl group or we can say the thiol groups and we know if it's the thiol sulfide group it's the cysteine groups that are found on the active side so as we already mentioned that an enzyme is a protein that's attached uh, joined uh, by amino acids so some of those amino acids for polyphenol oxidase found on the active side are made up of your sulfites or your, your cysteine containing uh, amino acids so what happens is that what these sulfides do is that they go and then they bind to the sulfhydryl groups at the active site if something is bound there it means that when the substrate comes it cannot bind there because that space is already occupied so the key and lock theory cannot form and therefore in that way the enzyme cannot catalyze the reaction and another way of doing that is that we had already mentioned that um, sulfides are reducing agents reducing agents in such a way that what they do is that um, they reduce the, the the formed product which is then your very reactive quinones and by doing so what it does is that it binds uh, it reduces the, 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 the quinones back to being a diphenol by donating of a hydrogen so in that way they act as reducing agents back to the diphenol less stable diphenol and in, in that way then we know that browning will not take place the melanin won't be produced and then the third way of doing it targeted still towards the product is that um the main uh, primary role with then what happens is that your your bisulfite what it does is it then react with this benzoquinone remember we said benzoquinones are highly unstable they want to react with everything so then what these bisulfites will do is that it will just react with that and form what we call sulfoquinones and those sulfoquinones are quite stable so once this uh, sulfoquinone is formed it cannot then spontaneously polymerize with the lipids proteins and minerals to form the brown polymer so evident to that would be the some of the practicals that we did in food chemistry 3 in the previous years whereby we extracted polyphenol oxidase from different um, uh, uh, vegetables so we had your apple your banana and your avocado and we used the substrate catechol so as you can already see of the different um, inhibitors that were used um, sulfites with all the different enzymes became the best inhibitors as you can see no color formation was formed and that can also be due to the fact that it has many ways in which it uh, 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 it prevents browning okay and then our second uh, inhibitor that we also gonna focus mostly on based on how well it functions is your ascorbic acid so your ascorbic acid as we already know we spoke about ascorbic acid and its analogs and ascorbic acid another name for ascorbic acid is vitamin c so ascorbic acid the functions of ascorbic acid is that ascorbic acid is an oxygen scavenger so it means it's targeted towards the substrate oxygen what it happens is that um, in the system when you have ascorbic acid it will react with the oxygen before the oxygen gets to the chemical reaction or to the system so it means that oxygen has a higher affinity for ascorbic acid so that's why it would rather react with the the ascorbic acid than going to participate in the reaction so it becomes an ascorbic uh, an oxygen scavenger and another mode of action will be we already mentioned that that ascorbic acid is an acidulant so it will bring down the temperature the ph below five and seven which is then the the perfect range and then in that way because when we spoke about acidulants we we go back to the protein structure where we talk about 
when you are adding an acid or even a base, but obviously in this instance we're talking about adding your hydrogen protons, what they do is they disturb the ionic interaction that's taking place in the tertiary structure of the protein. So it actually breaks down those ionic interaction and in that way it changes the three-dimensional structure of the protein and then affects how the substrate will then bind when those um, changes have been effected. And then lastly, your, 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 your ascorbic acid, what it does, it also has the reducing effect whereby it also does the same way it reduces your quinone back to your diphenols and then in that way it delays the onset of polymerization. However, um, very important in terms of ascorbic acid, unlike your sulfites, ascorbic acid are not as stable. So what happens is that when ascorbic acid is doing the reduction of quinone to, to diphenols, it becomes used because remember it has to donate the hydrogens and by donating the hydrogens over some time it depletes and when it does so it is then converted to what we call dehydroascorbic acid and then dehydroascorbic acid does not have the reducing effect because it has already lost its hydrogen so it can no longer donate so what happens is that um, when that happens the diphenol can then revert back can still be oxidized because if we still remember chemistry we always say enzymes never get consumed the only thing that's consumed is the substrate so the enzymes are still there in the process waiting to have a substrate so then when these um, ascorbic acid is then changed to dehydroascorbic acid then the reaction then continues so we can say that ascorbic acid can be used as a processing aid before uh, any other process like maybe your blanching or your heating or your blanching and heating is the same thing or or drying before you know that you just need time to be able to do the preparation but you're not relying on ascorbic acid to prevent browning throughout so also looking at some of the previous experiments that we've done um, this is what we call in vivo enzymatic browning inhibition whereby we juiced apple juice from granny smith apples and then we added this inhibitors all at 0.1% concentration. So as you can already see, you have your control sample there, browning took place, citric acid, ETA, but look at the potassium metabisulfite and ascorbic acid. So you can already see that ascorbic acid and potassium metabisulfite are on the same level as also pasteurization heating. So that is why they are widely used based on their excellent um, activities so here's just another example of what we still did in class this was more an accelerated form of browning because you can already see that we did this experiments in open jars or open beakers whereby we were actually accelerating uh, or bombarding the, the 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 contents with oxygen we didn't even close it meanwhile when you go to the shop you will find everything packaged and 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 and, and tightly closed so there we had apple juice at room temperature after an hour using the same type of uh, inhibitors and then the same effect after 24 hours. So you can already see ascorbic acid and sodium sulfide um, being the best compared to the rest. Same applies after 24 hours of the juice being exposed to oxygen. So you can already see how good or how potent these two inhibitors are. And then on the right hand side, we also have um, potato juice. I don't know who juices potato juice, but we tried that. And then you can already see the same effect, ascorbic acid. And then sodium sulfide was just changing color there. Maybe it has to do the, with the reactivity. Remember when you are selecting an inhibitor, you need to know that it's, it's not toxic. And very important, it does not react with other components and thereby bringing other deleterious uh, chemical reactions. But look at what happened to the, the, the experiment after 24 hours. There was then a change in color and then sodium sulfide. You can still see that it is still clear. So the chemical reaction did not take place. But look at ascorbic acid. So ascorbic acid proved what we just spoke about earlier, whereby we mentioned that ascorbic acid uh, will get consumed over time. And the same thing did not happen here in apple juice that also confirms that 
there's different types of enzymes even substrate in different types of products and then lastly we also did the same with your apple slices that are dipped in the same uh, inhibitors at 0.1 percent we still see sodium sulfate being the best and then ascorbic acid browning took place and that will definitely be to the fact that it was exposed thank you